Welcome to the first of two lectures covering polyurethanes as part of thermoset resins. In this lecture, we're going to discuss raw materials and the polymerization of polyurethane systems. So first, we're going to state some objectives. First, we're going to talk about the forms of polyurethanes, the characteristic group of a polyurethane, which is, spoiler, a urethane, raw materials, uh, resinification, or in other words, polymerization reactions, uh, processing challenges, the concept of isocyanate index, different polyurethane systems, the concept of free isocyanate groups, the properties of polyurethanes, and then of course applications. So the ever-present history portion. Uh, polyurethanes were first developed uh, by Otto Bayer and his co-workers around 1937. And they had some advantages over existing plastics um, that were not covered by, by Wallace Carruthers. So Wallace Carruthers did a lot with polyesters. Otto Bayer was trying to come up with something that um, had different, similar properties, but were not already protected by patents. And what he focused on early was the production of fibers and flexible foams. Uh, polyurethanes themselves were applied in a very limited scale as an aircraft coating during World War II. Uh, it was post-war when polyisocyanates became commercially available in 1952. And so you had the production of flexible polyurethane foam, rigid foams, gum rubbers, and elastomers using TDI uh, and polyester polyols in 1954. Uh, in 1956, DuPont introduced polyether polyols. Uh, the reason for this being an advancement is that polyether polyols were cheaper, easier to handle, and more water resistant. They were less likely to have uh, hydrolytic stability issues than uh, polyester polyols. In 1960, about 45,000 metric tons of flexible polyurethane foams were produced. In 1967, urethane modified polyisocyanurate rigid foams were introduced and that offered even better thermal stability and flammability resistance than rigid foams that had been developed prior. In the 1980s, uh, water-blown microcellular foams were first used as mold gaskets for automotive seat panels and other applications. The reason that this is a significant landmark is when it comes to the uh, blowing agent used in foams, prior to that these were uh, uh, volatile organic compounds, CFCs, bad for the environment, water-blown foams it, were much more environmentally friendly. Uh, also, these uh, mold gaskets replaced PVC plastisols in automotive applications. So they were moving away from uh, a PVC toward a polyurethane for these applications. Uh, polyurethane foams are now used as high temperature oil filters uh, for autom automotive applications. Uh, in the 1990s, the Montreal Protocol restricted the use of many chlorine containing blowing agents, and so by the late 1990s, the use of a green blowing agent were widely used in North America and the European Union. When it comes to the rising costs of petrochemical feedstocks and enhanced public desire for environmentally friendly products, uh, you saw the development of polyols derived from vegetable oils. And this is actually the technology that was developed at KPRC in the early 1990s and is being developed to this day. So when it comes to polyurethanes, the big application area are foams, flexible, rigid, and everything in between, also integral skin foams. Polyurethanes are also used as either thermosetting or thermoplastic elastomers. They're used in lesser degree uh, in terms of paints, coatings, adhesives, and elastomeric fibers. The characteristic group of a polyurethane is the urethane group. Uh, I know it's shocking, but this is a urethane group. This is a urethane linkage. It looks very similar to an amide linkage, but you have this extra oxygen after the carbonyl. So in an amide, this would go to an R group, whereas here it goes to an oxygen. So this is a polyurethane. If it had brackets and an N, for sure it would be a polyurethane. But this is not this. This is an isocyanate group. This is one of the things you react to create a urethane linkage, but this is not a urethane. This is an isocyanate. What you are doing to make a urethane is doing an addition polymerization between a polyisocyanate, an NCO group, and a polyol, or OH groups. Uh, this is one of those polymerizations which is a weird exception to the rule. Uh, it acts like a condensation in how it um, builds molecular weight, but you don't condense a small molecule. So this is that exception to everything has an exception 
rule in terms of um, types of synthesis. Um, polyisocyanates and molecules with single hydroxyl groups can react, so that'd be water or phenols. Polyisocyanates and molecules with single active hydrogens can also react, so urea or olefinates. What's an olefinate? I'll get to that. Polyisocyanates and molecules with one or more active hydrogen can also react, like the nitrogens on amines. So the take-home message from this is polyisocyanates will react with pretty much everything you put them in, 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 the, uh, in, in the presence of in terms of an, a reaction. It's how you get those things to react in a way you want instead of a way you don't want. Now we have some reactions. I guarantee you I will be asking you about these reactions, and there are a number of them. So you should commit these to memory if at all possible. So here are a series of reactions that can happen within a polyurethane system as it's reacting. The go-to one is a isocyanate with a polyol. That's how you get a urethane bond, so this bond right here. But other things can also happen. Uh, you can create amines as part of these reactions. So if you, if you react an isocyanate plus an amine, you get a urea compound. Urea? This isn't urea. Yes, it is. It's a urea. Um, it's a type of urea. It's not urea TM. In other words, if this was an H and this was an H, it would be urea as we know it. But this is a urea type compound. It is a urea as opposed to the urea. So that's what I mean by that. Now you can react an isocyanate with a urea. So you act this isocyanate group with this group on the urea. This ends up in what's called a biuret. You can also react an isocyanate with the urethane group because this has an active hydrogen. So then you get an olefinate. You can also uh, react an isocyanate with carboxylic acid. That gives you an amide. So remember, this is an amide. If we had an oxygen here, it would be a polyurethane. So that's why you have to be careful with those. But in addition to reacting with a carboxylic acid, you don't just get an amide, you get a carbon dioxide molecule. So this is where you start getting bubbles. That might be good, that might be bad. And then of course, the reaction of isocyanate with water. Uh, this happens in a two-step reaction, and it can be good and it can be bad. In a water-blown foam, this is a good thing. In a, uh, you know, a situation where you don't want uh, water to react with it, it is not a good thing. So uh, here you have an isocyanate, a molecule of water, and this creates this sort of amic acid sort of intermediate. This thing is not particularly stable. It decomposes right away into an amine and carbon dioxide gas and then that um, isocyanate reacts again with the resulting amine to give you a urea. So, some raw materials. Uh, TDI is one of those, so toluene diisocyanate, and you have a mixture of isomers there, so they are either in, they are either ortho-ortho or ortho-para, or 2,4 ortho or 2,6 diisocyanate. Iso also isoperone diisocyanate, so this is a aromatic isocyanate. This is an aliphatic cyclic isocyanate. Uh, the reason why they're isocyanates, they have this group. They have this group. They have this group. And then methylene diphenyl diisocyanate. So methylene diphenyl diisocyanate. Then there are your other groups. So you need an isocyanate, you need hydroxyls. Well, what contributes hydroxyls? Uh, lots of things. You can use dipropylene glycol, you can use diethylene glycol, you can use ethylene glycol, you can use propylene glycol, you can use hydrogen-rich polyesters, you can use other hydroxyl-rich polyols like polyethers. So you can react anything with a hydroxyl group with your isocyanate, including water. So some information on some of these polyisocyanates. Uh, TDI is a colorless liquid at room temperature. It is a small molecule. Uh, its freezing point is about 12 Celsius, its boiling point is about 251. The reason why we want to know that is because typically you have to distill your TDI to get a nice uh, pure reactant. It does have a relatively, it, it, it has a flash point that you have to be mindful of. This is often stored at room temperature. Usually uh, to, to avoid the precipitation of crystals, you want it to remain in liquid form if possible. Uh, this is an ideal reaction uh, because it gives fast gelation, so really fast reaction. And for foams, that's what you want. But it is nasty. Isocyanates are poisonous. They can cause immediate breathing problems and skin blistering. Uh, and it can cause an allergic type reaction. So if you've never worked with an isocyanate before um, and you have some sort of anaphylactic reaction, it's known as isocyanate allergy, and it can be very dangerous. So uh, not that these things are, are 
good for people who don't have isocyanate allergy. They can be very dangerous for everybody. So um, typically, uh, I don't ever use this stuff outside of a hood. And if we were doing reactions with isocyanates, I wouldn't allow undergrads to handle them. You have to be careful. Uh, they're, whenever I use them, even if I use them in a hood, they give me a little bit of shortness of breath. Typically, TDI is a mixture of 80 to 20, 2 to 4, and 2 to 6 isomers. Uh, as with anything, in terms of materials, the demand for it only grows. Uh, we see fairly steady growth per year. Um, it is it's a fairly expensive uh, material, so over a dollar a pound. Um, and so, you know, it's, some, it's one of these things that makes a polyurethane an engineering thermoset. This is another uh, polyisocyanate. This is a colorless liquid. Again, it's a small molecule um, with a boiling point of 151 and a similar flash point. So if you're going to distill that, you got to be careful. Methylene diphenyl diisocyanate, or MDI. Again, it's a small molecule. Uh, it has a melting point that's slightly above room temperature. Uh, typically, this is stored in a refrigeration to extend the shelf life. You should not store it in a glass bottle because it will react with the glass. It needs to be heated for several hours to liquefy it, and then you use any, any precipitate you throw away, you use whatever liquid portion is left. This is often used as a replacement for TDI. Um, it doesn't give as fast a gel rate, gelation rate as TDI, but it's just as poisonous. So again, you're not going to be using this as sunscreen or doing this in a situation where you're not treating this like a dangerous chemical like it is. And then there's the other, then there's the other stuff, the polyols. Uh, basically, this is where you can tailor things to the application. Polyether or polyester, and then they're further classified according to their end use. So higher molecular weight polyols, more flexible, lower molecular weight, more rigid. Um, conventional polyester polyols are manufactured by direct polyesterification of very high purity diacids and glycols. Uh, these are usually more expensive for that reason, but you want to control acid number and you want to control uh, impurities because impurities can very easily react in a detrimental way with your isocyanate. Um, so while they are more expensive, polyester polyols, they tend to give you better solvent abrasion and cut resistance in the resulting application. There are graft polyols, so polymer solids with high molecular weight polyether backbone. Uh, and these are often used as sort of a filler and an active reaction, reactant, so they increase the load bearing properties and add toughness. There are also specialty polyols like polycarbonate polyols, polycaprolactone, polybutadiene, uh, polysulfide, fluorinated polyols, and then of course natural oil polyols derived from vegetable oils. Um, we talk about epoxidized soybean oil at KPRC a lot. From epoxidized soybean oil, you can get something with lots of hydroxyl groups on it, and you can make you can tailor that reaction to give you something appropriate for a flexible foam, something to give you something appropriate for a rigid foam, and everything in between. And of course, doesn't come from petrochemicals, uh, more environmentally friendly, more sustainable. So here's an example of a polyether polyol, so polytetramethylene oxide. Um, and this is used in high performance coatings, uh, wetting applications and elastomer applications. Uh, and you can get this particular uh, material uh, at low molecular weights, so between 250 to 3000, and it's a waxy solid. Um, it can be further processed into polymers with higher molecular weights. Uh, this is, is, comes from THF, uh, which again can come from oat hulls, so this is a product that can come from a sustainable resource. This is known as terethane from Invista or poly-THF from BASF. Processing polyurethanes is kind of an art form, and there's a lot of problems with it, and so we have to discuss those, and the big one being water in the form of moisture. Isocyanates have hydro they have oxygens, they have nitrogens, they're very hygroscopic, they love to suck up water upon exposure. And water reacts with those isocyanates readily. So it degrades the number of isocyanate groups that are left, it causes pregelation, and it causes carbon dioxide. And so you get a foam. And maybe you don't want a foam, or maybe you want to control your foam better. So water in the presence of these materials reduces the shelf life. Um, so water, water level in, the, in a polyisocyanate has to be kept very, essentially non-existent, as low as you possibly can. So handling it, storing it, uh, usually you have a pre-polymer, so this is advanced molecular weight, uh, so m say multiple units of MDI, but there's no uh, cross-linking that's gone on yet. You also don't shake the container. 
Uh, if there's a headspace in that container, you can mix whatever's in that headspace down into the polymer, the pre-polymer itself. So let's say that that was air. Well, now it's air that has moisture in it. Now you've mixed that into it, and you've reduced the, um, you, you may cause some pre-gelation. Also, um, if you can, use the contents immediately after opening in a container and use it all. Uh, you don't use super high-speed mixing. If you're making a foam, you can. But if you're doing this especially for a coating, you don't want to use high-speed mixing. You mix it just enough to get things mixed together, because if you want, if you whip air into it, you also whip moisture into it. So a slower speed or a paddle mixing, and then you stir whatever ingredients you have uh, for three minutes maximum. If you have to store leftovers, the best way to do it is under a nit nitrogen blanket and in the presence of a desiccant or something that keeps the ambient moisture low. So. Isocyanate index is something that is a natural extension of the problem with water. So the isocyanate index is the ratio of isocyanate groups to hydroxyl groups. And we only need an uh, ideal ratio of one to one. They react one to one to give you a urethane. Great, we can all go home. But no. Um, having those isocyanate groups be effective and available for cross-linking is critical in order to make urethane groups, strong cross-links. And so if some of that has been degraded by something else, then you won't get good cross-linking. So for most thermosets, your isocyanate index is greater than one. So you have an excess of isocyanate groups. Because polyisocyanates are expensive, you try to keep that excess to a minimum. So typically that's about 5% excess NCL to make sure you have enough available for reaction and any excess can cure with atmospheric moisture or urea or whatever. Or if you do happen to have some moisture contamination, you still have enough isocyanate available to polymerize. For a thermoplastic, isocyanate index is usually less than one. Now, there are two types, or sorry, there are five types, oh my gosh, of polyurethanes when characterizing by processing system. There are one-step systems, two-step systems, there are moisture-cured systems, there are blocked isocyanate systems, and there are even water-based uh, uh, systems. So you can, in fact, have water present. These can be water-based coatings or water-based systems. Um, but it requires knowledge of the chemistry. So a one-shot polyurethane system has an isocyanate, polyol, and any other additives put together all together. And then that is transferred immediately to a mold or a surface for the final product. Um, oftentimes you have a silicone oil that stabilizes the structure and regulation. You also have things like calcium carbonate, fillers for good quick gel strength. So this is something that you mix together and you put into the in, into the mold and it has to have green strength right away. Uh, fillers are present heavily in these systems. They can be very low, but they can also be up to 30%. This reduces blistering and it also enhances dimensional control when you have a caulking or sealing application. Um, catalysts are present to reduce reaction time from several hours to less than 30 minutes. These are tin octoates um, or tertiary amines. Um, usually when I formulate foams, I've got both tin compounds and things like Dabco, so triethylene, diamine, together to get fast reaction. Uh, when you make slab stock foams, so flexible foams, in other words, your memory foam mattress, uh, you can make things that are 96 inches wide by 48 inches high on a continuous foam. Uh, so it's coming out, you know, like you would from an extruder, just coming out continuously up to 96 inches wide and up to four feet high. 90% of all flexible polyurethane foams are polyol or polyether based. About 10% are polyester based. In a two-shot system, uh, this is what generally the consumer uses. So if you ever wanted to do do your own spray installation, good for you. That sounds like a horrible job, but this is what you'd, you'd be given. You'd be given component A and component B. And your component A, you'd have your isocyanate pre-polymer, uh, and that would be a pre-polymer adduct that has some sort of advanced molecular weight. That also builds molecular weight fastest, and it helps reduce some of the toxicity of the isocyanate. You also have your component B. So that's your polyol, other ingredients, catalysts, emulsifiers, antifoaming agents, curing agents, fillers, what have you, all in the other component. Then you mix them together right when you want to use them. So again, the pre-polymer for the isocyanate is usually an adduct. So it is something that a polyisocyanate that's been reacted with an iso a hydroxyl-rich compound to make a linear uh, pre-polymer. So this gives it high molecular weight, higher viscosity, it gives you fewer terminal isocyanate groups, but that also gives you less time to achieve the final product, which is a cross high molecular weight cross-linked product. Um, 
This also helps reduce shrinkage and stresses and it redu reduces your exotherm. And again, if you're giving this to the consumer, you wanna um, reduce those violent exotherms any way you possibly can. This also reduces the problem of water uh, because the adduct is more stable than a small molecule isocyanate. So this concludes um, the first lecture for uh, polyurethanes. Um, we will have one more lecture on polyurethanes. So please answer your short quiz on this lecture and then move to the second polyurethane lecture.